We're in a government shutdown because President Trump insists that the country needs a border wall. But just how effective would a wall actually be? Border Patrol agents have discovered nearly 230 cross-border tunnels that run into the U.S. used to transport cocaine, meth, and marijuana. Maria Villarreal spoke to Border Patrol agents in Arizona to see how they're working to combat this underground threat. Border Patrol agents not only have to protect what's above the border, well, I'll go down first. but also what lies beneath. This is already in place built by the cities to drain water. Infrastructure that smugglers are taking advantage of. What they're building is tapping into this, and they're building an illicit tunnel. The deputy patrol agent in charge in Nogales, Kevin Hecht, took us through the tunnels used to train agents to spot breaches made by smugglers. Sometimes we got to strip down because it's so tight. Gun belt off and gun in a hand and a flashlight in the other. Very, very simple. Earlier this month, the Mexican Federal Police discovered this tunnel that accessed the sewer system that flows into the United States. And last month, the Border Patrol sealed this unfinished tunnel that crossed into Arizona. These tunnels are about drugs, Ed. Yes, for the most part. So Heck says smugglers' ongoing use of these makes tunnel training essential. In training, you'll go in this pipe and you'll be like, okay, I'm above ground, I'm crawling the pipe, everything's fine. Okay, let's put you some under, under some earth and see how you react. You how do you that. not then get that claustrophobic feeling? Like, how do you get them past that? You can't. So either you're going to do it or you're not. And then we figure out who that is. Because so they're smuggling contraband into these pipes. So we need to make that stop. So it's the point is to find those, remediate the tunnel, fill it with concrete, and then move on to the next pipe. Mireya Villarreal, Nogales, Arizona. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman is joining me now to talk about one person who used several smuggling routes to get drugs into the U.S. Of course, it's El Chapo, right? It is indeed. Um, so the uh, trial grinds on. Um, we've They've spent a lot of time on this prison break. And I think for a lot of people, that's when El Chapo, at least in this country, sort of came into, they became aware of El Chapo. Well, he became after, a mythical figure. That's precisely right. So tell us about what we've learned about the prison break that we didn't know before. Well, I think that one of the things we get are extraordinary visuals at this trial of the prison break. One of the things we did not know was the integral part that his wife played mm -hmm. in the prison break, and including the fact that it is possible she was one of two of his visitors who gave him a watch that had a GPS. The sons go and buy the land that is eventually uh, where the tunnel is dung, uh, dug under their land. And we actually get to see the tube of the tunnel. There is a motorcycle type of machine right. that is put on tracks that he is able to get out of his cell, get onto that, ride it through the tunnel, and come up on the other side. And it's really quite remarkable um, when you think of it. It is something that we do think of as being in a Mission Impossible movie. Right. Um, it's something that we think of as being in something totally fictional, not in, rea in reality. Right. So I think that is what made him the most known. I mean, we may have heard of the Sinaloa drug cartel, but not in the detail that we've gotten to know it. Mm -hmm. You also have to remember this is not his first prison break. I mean, he gets to escape, gets captured, yeah. he escapes, gets recaptured. It's really quite remarkable, yeah. which is the reason there is so much security involving him at this trial. Um, so this trial is all about him being the head of the Sinaloa cartel. So this is quite an elaborate scheme and creation to get him out of prison. What does the escape say about his ranking within the Sinaloa cartel? Well, if he's not the top man, he has got to be near the top, because why else would people make this kind of an effort mm. to break someone out of prison? And obviously, the prosecution's entire intent is to say this plan was so elaborate and expensive that the only reason it would be so is because he's the head of the Sinaloa drug cartel. Mm. Perhaps one day in the future, El Mayo, who was either the boss, 
the number two or the partner of El Chapo, who is still at large, mm -hmm. perhaps one day if he is captured, we'll learn about how he has evaded in a yes. capture and escaped all these years it, himself. Indeed, because you know they're hunting for him. Um, so oh, we hope a, they're hunting for him. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, a former prison director is going to be wrapping up his cross-examination. He was sort of in cahoots with El Chapo. And now, where do we go from here? Well, the next witness, it is said, is going to be a handwriting expert and the handwriting expert it becomes very powerful not so much because of what that person is going to say mm -hmm. that I know how to recognize handwriting right. it's what that person recognizes there are a cache of documents lots of letters that are handwritten according to the expert by El Chapo the defense could not afford to stipulate to that because there are direct admissions in these letters you have words like kilos you have words like tons you actually have instructions to this fellow who had once been in the prison system who then became a uh, very close worker of El Chapo's. You even have it down to the level, he was a micromanager, of the crop duster dusting the plants and watering the plants. So I, I really think it's fascinating at how involved he was in every aspect of his business. And now it's all in writing. Very smart move on the prosecution's part to save it for the very end. So, in case you had any doubt about where this guy was in the hierarchy of the Sinaloa drug cartel, right. you learned it in the middle, for sure with the IT guy, you learn it then with this elaborate, detailed version of the escape, and now the handwriting expert. The prosecution says that it may be complete by the 28th, which is Monday, which may mean they might be complete today. We'll be watching. Interesting. So one of the things that the prosecution has done throughout this case is, you know, we've gotten sort of little glimpses of his life, whether it's his life with his um, mistress or, you know, life in prison. And sometimes they don't really seem connected. Well, I think that they're, the reason they don't seem connected is the same reason when we watch an episode of Narcos on TV, whether we go back <laughs> to Pablo Escobar or the Cali Cartel yeah. or Narcos Mexico. You have people who are living the high life in billions and billions of dollars, and that's not an exaggeration, coming into their empires. And they have these mansions, and then somehow they wind up in these huts that have plastic furniture and bare a place to use a bathroom right. because they're hiding. So ultimately, the lavish lifestyle that they might have sought becomes completely at odds with the lifestyle that they have to live, which is a person on the run. Mm -hmm. Crime doesn't pay, at least not forever. Well, it pays in money, but <laughs> as it is not forever. And one thing I think that has been very true in this case is the characterization by Alan Foyer from the New York Times, and I'm going to leave you with this, okay. about how many witnesses who have testified against El Chapo who worked for him, who actually not at him, according to the New York Times, I wish I could coin it myself, as if to say, well, this is the way it had to end, my friend. Mm -hmm. How poetic. Ricky mm. Kleeman, thank you so much.